It's just true that every few years we face some crises and we notice that something quite out of the ordinary is happening and it might not be good. Do you remember, for example, the Y2K scare? And um, perhaps this is a little bit more real for some of you. Do you remember the stock market crash of 2008 and 2009? Or, and this was quite serious, do you remember SARS? Now, when Y2K happened, Irene and I, as well as our best friends Nick and Nundi, um, and all of our kids, we loaded a picnic cooler. Uh, I think it's a 50-gallon cooler, but a big one. We loaded a picnic cooler with mementos of our lives from our two families. So what went into the picnic cooler were tapes of all of us talking about what our lives were like, plus a tape recorder, because we had read that tape recorders will be impossible to find in the future. Articles that both Nick and I had written for religious and popular journals, pictures of the family and newspapers and awards that we had collected, and even a coin collection, all Canadian nickels since 1930. Um, so we loaded all this into the cooler and we wrapped each item and then everything in the cooler and the outside of the cooler in multiple layers of plastic. And then on New Year's Eve, before a roaring bonfire with chocolate, we buried that cooler. And I'm not telling you where. We left maps, though, for our kids and grandkids to find the cooler back in the year 2050. It was our way of thumbing our nose at Y2K. And yet, given everybody else's raised eyebrows, both of us, that is, both of our families, also socked away quite a few jugs of water and several weeks' worth of canned food rice, and beans, because you know, you can't be too careful. When the stock market crash happened in 2008, Irene and I again did what the experts suggested. In this case, it was nothing. We didn't panic. We didn't buy gold. Uh, we didn't sell our stock portfolio because you can't be too careful, and so you should listen to the experts. And we made out great. And now we are all collectively raising our eyebrows again, this time on account of the COVID-19 virus. We don't know how serious this epidemic will be compared to, say, the 2003 SARS epidemic. Um, it appears that this one spreads more easily, but fortunately the COVID-19 virus is less dangerous than the SARS virus, if you catch it. Um, the vast, vast majority of people who come down with COVID-19 will be fine. Still, as you heard in the children's sermon, we are all now washing, I hope you are washing your hands more often. Uh, we are bumping elbows or curtsying. Um, we're wondering about whether or not we should travel and, and how far we should travel and under what circumstances and when and why. So Irene and I were supposed to fly to uh, La Paz, Baja, Mexico, on the very southern tip of Baja on March 18, but we decided to cancel our trip. You can't be too careful and you don't want to be stuck way, way away from home in case you know, they're not taking people from Mexico or any other country. So Irene and I are going to have a staycation instead, and our dog, Jax, will thank us. Still, if we're honest, our eyebrows are raised, and it is all a little bit unsettling. What can I say? I'm not a doctor. 
The guidelines, such as they are, are simple and posted everywhere, thanks to Michael, throughout the church. And as your minister, I hope that you are religious about following those guidelines. But there is an elephant in the room here. And it is death. I read a compelling little story about death this week. It goes like this. Once some tourists from Canada were visiting Poland. They had heard about the famous Polish rabbi, Hafez Haim. And they managed to receive an invitation to Hafez Haim's home, where they would visit with him. And when the tourists arrived, they were surprised to see that the rabbi's home was only one simple room, just filled with books, and his only furniture was a table and a bench. Rabbi, they asked, where is your furniture? Well, where is yours, said the rabbi. Oh, but we are only visitors here, answered the tourists. Ah, said the rabbi, so am I. When it comes to life, we are all tourists. That is why I have made a point in the past, on several occasions, to preach sermons about death. But today, especially since our eyebrows are raised, and because of COVID-19, and because of the age of many people sitting in this sanctuary, I'm going to talk about death again. Our mortality should not be the elephant in this room because it is a church sanctuary after all. And then when I'm finished saying something about death, I'm going to say something about life too. Now, Lawrence Park Community Church members hold a variety of views about what happens when we die. Uh, that makes speaking about death complicated here, if not less important. So for example, some of you, perhaps many of you, have very traditional beliefs, beautiful traditional beliefs about death. That is, you hope that when you die you will go to heaven. And this Sunday scripture that Eric read is full of that kind of hope exactly. I consider, says Paul, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to me. And in fact, says Paul, I'm waiting for the redemption of our bodies. And he's talking about resurrection, of course. But look, there are others in this church who are much less certain about all this life after death stuff. And maybe they don't believe any of it because they are atheists. We have a number. Because they are post-theists, we have certainly a number of those. These members of Lawrence Park Community Church take what Paul says about life after death with a large grain of salt. They are with the psalmist. The psalmist who says in Psalm 6, in death, there is no remembrance of Yahweh. In Sheol, the afterlife, who can give Yahweh praise? No one. These members believe that death is simply the end of the road. And there are many, many, many positions in between these two extremes. What do I think? Two things. First, I am okay with the uncertainty. Whatever the ultimate truth about death is, I really like the title of Julian Barnes' lovely little book, Nothing to be Frightened of. I also know that many Christians, and for that matter, many Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and pagans, I, 
They have all, we have all come up with 101 detailed explanations for what happens, exactly what happens when we die. So in Christianity, for example, depending which group of Christians you belong to, we talk about intermediate states after death, resurrection, judgments, new earths coming down out of heaven, new Jerusalems, even meeting Jesus in the sky, raptures, all that stuff. Who knows? Maybe one group of Christians or pagans or Hindus actually has the post-life map exactly right. Could be. But what is more interesting and alluring to me than the details that all these different religions suggest is the near universal sense that we humans have always had that there is more to life than just this life. And that widespread human recognition seems really important to me. So, when people ask me, what do I think of life after death? I answer, I hope so. When I die, I, I hope the next moment I awake to a grand adventure I'd really like that. But if not, when I die, I will get my best night's sleep ever. The second important thing to say, I think more, m much more important than I'm not exactly sure, the next important thing to say is this. Following Jesus is for the living and not for the dead. Remember that story I told you a few moments ago about being tourists? The rabbi's name, I mentioned it twice, do you remember? That the rabbi's name was Hafez Hayim. Hafez Hayim. And that means responsible caretaker of life. Havez, responsible, and Hayim, life. And that is exactly what Jesus and many other prophets call us to be with our lives, responsible caretakers, to live, to really live responsibly, to cherish and nurture life wherever we find it, to seize and embrace it and make something of it. Here I offer just two pieces of advice of advice. Though really, if you think about it, nearly every Sunday when you come to church, you're going to get some advice about how to live. But, but I only have two things to advise you about today with respect to responsibility. But because of our raised eyebrows and in, in the interest of living responsibly, um, I will also add something inspirational after. Practically speaking, then, responsibly speaking, make sure that your affairs are always in order. In order enough that in case you do die, those who survive will know what to do next. As a minister, I have to be honest, um, I have seen deep family grief far too often, grief terribly compounded when persons who died had always refused to plan for that eventuality. So what does that mean? It means have a will and an advanced care plan or directive. And make sure that people know where these things are. Married or not, make sure that you're Bank accounts and credit cards and mortgages and titles and insurance are all in order. And that you understand that stuff. And leave a file behind where it can be easily located with your will, perhaps in your main desk drawer, certainly on the front of your computer, a file entitled, In Case of Death. Fill that file with practical information 
that people will need to tie up your affairs in a gracious manner that does credit to you. Irene and I have done this many years ago already. I know it all sounds a little bit weird to hear this kind of stuff from a pulpit, primarily dedicated to spiritual matters, but as I noted early, earlier, it, it, church is about the body and the spirit, and it's about all of life. And you might not hear this encouragement anywhere else if you don't hear it here. Not saying you won't, but you might not. And doing these things is spiritual because doing them is kind. And as Scripture tells us, be kind, says God, because I am kind. And now the inspirational piece. An inspirational piece that I have for those of us who, as Bruce Coburn once sang, live in dangerous times. Though again, I don't want to exaggerate how dangerous or put people on edge more than they need to be, but it's a really great song. You should listen to it. But anyways, it's this. No matter what your age or risk category, though perhaps especially if you are elderly, remember, now is the right time to do wonderful and beautiful things with your life. For we are not called merely to be responsible. We are tourists. And what tourist is a re tourist just to be responsible? No. Tourists do it for the joy of life. Do wonderful and delightful and loving things today. Say that you are sorry. Give a gift to someone who is beloved. Make a donation to a cause that matters to you. Now is the time to embrace a child, a grandchild, and to be truly present to that child, even if it takes time and energy and it's really you'd rather do the crossword puzzle. The Apostle John writes these words. My children, our love should not just be words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. So do it. It isn't too late. The time for love is always now, whether the sun is out as it is today or we live in shadow. The time for love is always right, no matter what the flu season does or does not bring. Amen.